It's now truly an honor and a blessing to give you Bill McKibben, whose keynote is titled Energy from Heaven or Energy from Hell. Bill McKibben. Yeah. Well, brother, thank you so much for that introduction. There is no single person in the country who's more faithfully or more um, powerfully taken this message and held it up year after year, place after place than Jim Antall. What an extraordinary honor to get to give a lecture in your name. And uh, Reverend Malcolm and Reverend Burt and everybody else, what a pleasure to get to join you. Now, it must be said, because I live way, lived my whole life way, way out in the end of dirt roads places. I, I'm a Methodist because that's, you know, who actually goes out there on the, uh, uh, you know, away from the nice tidy town greens and out on the end of the dirt roads. But I grew up in the UCC and my spiritual formation is entirely dependent on Hancock United Church of Christ in Lexington, Massachusetts and on Henry Clark and Ed McLean and the other wonderful people who uh, ran that congregation. So if you have trouble with what I'm saying, it's their fault and take it up with them. Um, that, that's where I learned how to think about the world. Um, I wanna say just a few things today. We've only got a few minutes and I'm gonna Speak so I'm going to speak just on the most powerful and important notes I can hit. Um, and I apologize in advance for the fact that some of them are a little daunting because we live at a daunting moment. When I wrote that book in 1989, the first book about what we now call climate change, what we back then called the greenhouse effect. Um, I think the year I was thinking about was probably 2023, because last year was the year when it became just absolutely clear how fundamentally human beings were uh, disrupting the processes of this planet. We had the hottest days ever recorded um, on this earth. Our records with thermometers go back about 250 years. But scientists are good at extending those records with proxies, with glacial cores and uh, lake sediments and things. And so they were very insistent on proclaiming that the hot days last year on this planet were the hottest days we've had on this earth in 125,000 years at a bare minimum. 125,000 years ago, the anthropologists tell us, was when people first started etching symbols on bones and things. So no human society that we would recognize as a society uh, has ever lived on a planet as hot as the one we are living on, and the results are already perilous. Um, I mean, I could list for many hours, all the things that happen when you begin to turn up the thermostat on this earth. But we saw them last year. Uh, you know, one of the first things that happens is you get, because warm air can hold more water vapor than cold, evaporation and then drought. And when it's hot and dry, things catch on fire. Those of you in this building will remember that we spent a large part of last summer sucking the smoke of those wildfires that decimated the glorious boreal forest of Canada. And once that water is evaporated up in the atmosphere, it's going to come down. It comes down now in deluge and downpour, whose only precedent is, uh, well, the story of Noah. Um, um, Vermont and New Hampshire got to feel that sting last summer like never before. We had the biggest rainfalls in our history. And we were reminded what happens when rain falls on places with steep slopes and narrow river valleys. What happens is hideous flooding. In Vermont, our capital city is still a shadow of itself. I, you know, a quarter mile from where I live, we lost a 
a house, uh, a trailer house that disappeared in a landslide. We couldn't get in and out of town for days because every road was, but Vermont and New Hampshire and the US in general are still rich enough that we can begin at least to talk about recovering from these things. That's not true in the rest of the world. A few weeks after the rain stopped here in New England, in Libya, they had the biggest rainstorm they've ever had. So big that in the course of a few hours, the rushing rivers wiped out a couple of dams and then swept into a coastal city where it swept 10,000 people out to sea. They drowned in the course of an hour. Um, that's the kind of weather that sometimes people describe as biblical. And it is the kind of thing we now see on a regular basis around the world, especially in those places that have done the least to cause the problem. Libya is in Africa, a continent which has produced 3% of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but is taking more damage than any place else. This country, with 3% of the world's population, has produced 25% of those gases. No country will ever catch up with us. And it's all still up there. The carbon dioxide that poured out of the tailpipe of my family's maroon Plymouth Fury when I was getting my learner's permit at the age of 15 in suburban Boston is all still up there in the sky trapping heat. Which makes this not just an extraordinary practical problem, but the greatest justice problem that the world has ever faced. and thus by extension the most difficult and thorny theological problem i think that we've ever run up against um we've made ourselves in short order larger than god we are able to determine where the seas rise when the seasons take place what storms appear on and on and on and in the process instead of loving our neighbors we're drowning our neighbors we're sickening our neighbors we're making it impossible for them to grow the food they need to eat on and on and on it is a dismal picture and it is getting worse fast we've raised the temperature of the planet a degree and a half celsius so far uh, it's about two and a half it's almost three degrees fahrenheit we're on path on our current trajectory in the lifetimes of people in this room to raise it about three degrees Celsius. If that happens, the implications are too large to almost bear talking about. Just to give one example of that current trajectory, the UN says it will be sufficient to produce between one and three billion climate refugees. That's the number of people who will have to up and leave their homes because it will be too dry, too wet, too hot to live there any longer. A million refugees on our southern border were enough to completely discombobulate our politics and bring out the ugliest possible side of our national character. Multiply that by a thousand around the world and try to imagine what development, what war and peace, what the rights of women, what any of the other things we care about look like on a world that disrupted. The single most important task by an order of magnitude for human beings is to figure out how to not stop global warming, too late for that, but to arrest it short of the point where it cuts civilization off at the knees. That is a time limited task. This is not the poor you will always have with you. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change telling us that if we haven't cut emissions in half by 2030, then we cannot meet the targets we set in Paris. And in the process, we will produce poverty on a scale that we can't even begin to imagine. 2030 is, by my watch, five years and seven months away. That doesn't give us much time to work. It would be a difficult task, even if everybody was working in good faith. But as we'll see in a moment, not everybody is. Before we get to that, let me just say that though I've given you bad news, there is good news and good news aplenty. 
And it comes in this case above all from the world's scientists and engineers who have worked a real water into wine miracle over the last couple of decades. They have reduced the cost of energy from the sun and the wind 90% to the point where as of this moment, we live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. That is an almost unbelievable gift. It allows us to imagine rapid progress, not perfect free lunch. There is no utopia on these shores anyway. We're going to have to mine lithium and do other things that are disruptive, but the disruptions compared with the ones we're already creating by burning fossil fuel or compared with the hell that we are building very quickly on this planet are small, and the promise is enormous. The promise not only that we'll be able to cut short to some degree that rise in temperature, but also the promise that we will no longer need to pour into the air that pollution from the combustion of fossil fuels that kills nine million people a year. One death in five on this planet comes from breathing those particulates that lodge in people's lungs. It's by far the largest category of preventable death on planet Earth because we do not need to be burning things anymore. For 700,000 years, people have set things on fire. It served us well. It let us move north and south away from the equator. Nobody was going to live in New Hampshire before you could heat things up, you know. Um, but at this point, it's coming with these extraordinary costs to the climate, to public health, and also to our politics on this planet. Because as long as you depend on a commodity, coal, gas, and oil, that's only available in a few places, the people who control them end up with far too much power, which they then abuse. In our country, the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons who took their winnings and used them to degrade our democracy. In Europe, it's Vladimir Putin who took his and used it to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century. So the promise of this other possibility is unbelievably attractive. The good Lord was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas in the sky, 93 million miles away, but we now know how to make full use of it. We can catch its rays on photovoltaic panels, and we can take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, creating the wind that turns those turbines. And that provides all the power that we could need. California for the last 30 days has been producing more than 100% of the power that it uses from sun and wind and hydro for six or seven hours a day. This is not some impossibility and it can happen everywhere on earth. The scientists have done the work to point out exactly how and how we would make that transition and how in the process if this is the thing that you care about, we would save enormous amounts of money. Not only because we wouldn't be doing huge amounts of damage, but simply because it's a lot cheaper to run the world on sun and wind. Because they're free. The sun rises above the horizon every morning and it delivers that abundance for nothing to all of us, everywhere. There's no Vladimir Putin of the sun and no Koch brothers of the wind. It belongs to all of us by the grace of God, which is great news, except if you're one of those people who happens to own a huge amount of coal or oil or gas that would be worthless in that world. And those people have figured it out and they are doing their damnedest to make sure that we do not make this transition. If you have any doubts, they're at this point willing to talk about it quite openly. The CEO of Exxon gave a interview to a couple of journalists from Fortune magazine a couple of weeks ago in which he said that Exxon would not be 
ever in the renewable energy business because it did not offer above average returns to our shareholders. Because, because, and here I return again to the idea, because the sun and the wind are free. They are gifts to us. And that is good news unless you prospered by making people pay every month for another installation, another quanta of the energy that you control the reserves of, that you own. So we're at this remarkable moment when with the wit and intelligence that God gave us, we could make an absolutely epic transformation for our species and in the process manage to make ourselves a little smaller, to take up a little less space on this earth, to cast a smaller shadow. But we have to do it fast. This is not, this is, what do they say on TV? This is a limited time offer, okay? Um, because once you pass certain points, there's no, go once we've melted the Arctic, nobody has a plan for how you freeze it back up again, okay? Once you've, once you've turned the Amazon into Savannah, which is what is happening at the moment in real time, nobody has a plan for how you grow a rainforest there again. Once you raise the surface of the level of the sea to the point where it's inundated our coastal cities, there is no way to drain it back, not in human time. So we have to act fast and we have to act forthrightly. We have to be willing to take on what I believe in the good book they called the powers and the principalities. Is that right, Jim? Is that, um, um, and in this case, those are those forces that want to, for their own selfish reasons, delay this transition so that it, their business model lasts another decade or two or three, even at the cost of breaking this planet. That is a, in some ways, political task, and there is no way around it. We're not having an argument about the science of climate, that's pretty much over, and it has been for a long time. What we're having a f is, is a fight, and a fight is usually about money and power, and so in this case. And that means that we have to use the tools that we have, which is not extraordinary amounts of money, okay? That's the power that the fossil fuel industry has, and they use it very Strategically, they purchase congressmen and senators, they have armies of lobbyists, so on and so forth. We won't be able to match that money, but we can build movements. That's the other strategy for change on our planet. Um, and it's a relatively new strategy. The great, two great inventions of the 20th century were the solar panel, and the nonviolent social movement. And they came, the nonviolent social movement came from the margins. It came from Gandhi and it came from Dr. King and it came from a million other people whose names we have forgotten if we ever knew them. But it, it provides a possibility for real change fast. And that means that if you and your congregations can join in this fight, there are things you can do close to home, and those things should be taken seriously, and it's a good idea to worry about the light bulbs in the sanctuary and to talk to the sexton about what the thermostat's set at and to worry about whether or not you're using plastic to, you know, and, and are there solar panels on the roof and so on and so forth. But, but, that's not in the end how we're going to solve this in a sense that plays into the great American obsession with the individual in all things. I'm happy that I have solar panels on my roof. I'm happy they connect to an EV. 
But we're not going to win this fight one Tesla at a time. The most important thing an individual or an individual congregation can do is join together with others in movements big enough and sharp enough to change the basic economic and political ground rules here in time. And that's going to take all the congregations that we can muster, but it's going to take them being willing to work even outside the boundaries of the church in these broader coalitions that make change happen. Those coalitions are here. People are doing good work. Many of the people doing good work are young people. That's who I started 350.org with, seven college students. That's who ran those divestment campaigns on college campuses and having gotten that training, um, went out and formed the Sunrise Movement and brought us the Green New Deal that was the precursor to the Inflation Reduction Act. Congress finally beginning to take some action here on this crisis. So the young people are doing their part. It is not okay to say or think, though it's very tempting, that it's up to the next generation to solve these problems, okay? It's ignoble thing to think, and it's an impractical thing to think because of that question of time. There is not time for the Greta generation to grow up and become senators and CEOs. We've got five or six years, which means that Young people, for all their energy and intelligence and idealism, lack the structural power to, by themselves, make the change we need on the scale that's required in the time that we have. Looking at the demographics of this congregation and imagining the demographics of UCC congregations across America, let me say, I think all the gray hair is a very good thing. Because if you've reached the age where you have hair coming out your ears, then you have structural power coming out your ears too. There are 70 million of us over the age of 60 in this country, and we punch above our weight politically because we all vote. There is no known way to stop old people from voting. <clears throat> And because we ended up with most of the assets, fair or not, we got about 70% of the money in the country. So if you want to lean on Wall Street or on Washington or on your state capital, then it helps to have some people with hairlines like mine. I'm going to end just by, since really I'm here to honor Jim Antall as much as anything else, to uh, return to that uh, 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 um, that protest against the Keystone Pipeline in the summer of 2011. And Dan and others who are here today were there too. Um, 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 when I wrote the letter asking people to come to Washington to get arrested in what turned out to be the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in a very long time in this country, 1,254 people going to jail, I said, I do not think young people should have to be the cannon fodder here, because if you're 19, it's possible that an arrest record is not the best thing for your resume. One of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, uh, you know, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? Um, and so uh, we didn't ask people as they got arrested, how old are you? But cleverly, I think we did ask everybody who was president when you were born. The two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. It was powerful for the young people who were there to see their elders acting the way we need elders acting in a working society not necessarily getting arrested. That's often the last part of this, and most of the work is more mundane. But being outside their comfort zones, because the planet is outside its comfort zone. We need to be doing this above all for the years to come, the short years that we have. And let me just end by saying, that the great advantage that people of faith have taking on this fight, that more secular environmentalists don't have, I think, is 
how to put it, is the idea that if we do absolutely everything that we can, that there is some force at work in the universe that might meet us halfway. That is the exact opposite of saying, God will take care of this problem, we don't need to worry about it. That strikes me as the worst theology that it is possible to imagine. But it does strike me as okay to think, because we all have to think. I mean, my first grandson was born a month ago tomorrow. I know someone now who's going to be alive in the 22nd century, so I'm not allowed the luxury of despair. It's all right to think that if we do everything we can, if we do push this world to transition from energy from hell to energy from heaven, that we have some real possibility of making the most significant change we ever could. No guarantee, I give you no guarantee. We're behind in this fight and the news is not good. Accept the news that there are millions and millions and millions of us brothers and sisters across this planet engaged in this fight and what a pleasure to have everybody spread out across this country in the UCC, taking it on and taking it seriously. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill McKibben as we allow for a microphone to be passed to someone in the pews there for our first question. Uh, we'll just take this opportunity to, to thank you and, and pray that uh, some ministers in the audience were taking notes and will translate your words into their sermon for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, that was a powerful message. Um, as, as I've learned from Jim Antall, to have some authentic hope, we need some authentic truth, and you were able to give us both today. So thank you very much. We'll now look to those who are gathered in Hanover to see if we have a first question for you. I seem to have answered all the questions <laughs> in my talk. I've got a question, Bill. Can you describe how easy it is to join Third Act <laughs> yes, third act is actually very easy, and we don't even check IDs. So if you're, you know, 57 and you want in, what the hell? I mean, um, you just go to thirdact.org and sign up, and then we will quickly uh, have you engaged, and we'll know where you come from, so we can get you with your local uh, chapter. They're in every state in the country now, and we have also chapters organized by sort of what people have done in their lives. So there's third act, healthcare workers and educators and things like that. And there is a wonderful third act faith group of which Jim Antall is one of the very wise leaders and they are doing remarkable work. It's funny, when we started this a couple years ago, people said, oh, this will not work because people become more conservative as they age. That's the sort of, uh, you know, I don't know if that was true uh, once upon a time, may have been, but it's not true, I think, of this generation of older people. If you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s now, your first act was in this moment of incredible, dynamic, cultural, social, political change. Uh, where we started taking women seriously in public life, the uh, height of the anti-war movement, the apex of the civil rights movement, and in, for these circumstances, the first Earth Day in 1970, when 20 million Americans, 10% of the then population of the country took to the streets, the biggest demonstration in American history, and enough within 18 months to have produced the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And I mean, think about what it was like to live in a time when Congress would actually respond to the demands of people and do it quickly and dramatically. Um, um, we need that very much again uh, uh, 
uh, Earth Day is, um, Earth Day 1970 remains a kind of iconic moment. And it's one that we're going to re try to recreate in certain ways in the year ahead. I can't really talk too much about it yet, but stay tuned because the summer solstice next year, I hope, becomes, uh, well, a kind of, um, you might call it a Sunday, um, um, when we manage to get across to the world what this possibility for transformation really looks like and how it can happen fast. Thank you for that response. Michael, I turn it to you now to tell us if we have a, a question from the audience. Yeah, Bill, um, I have a question here for you uh, from Van Carter. Have we not passed too many tipping points by now to ever return the earth to where it is, where it is even today? We've crossed a certain number of tipping points. There is no question. And there are things that we are never getting back. And that is just part of, you know, I mean, um, um, we live in a, in a fallen world, um, including in this respect. And, and that is um, painful to watch. Uh, some, some great uh, nature writer, Aldo Leopold maybe, said that the price of loving the natural world around us is to live in a certain amount of pain as we watch it change. And that has been certainly the story of my life. But there are plenty of lines we haven't yet crossed and that we can still stop short of, we hope. It'll just require very fast and thorough action. This is not something that we can take on incrementally. Most of our problems are like that. Most of our political problems are like that. As long as I've been alive, we've been talking about whether or not we should have national health insurance. And we make incremental progress in that direction, and then we slide back a little bit. We'll get there, I think, eventually, because every other industrialized country in the world got there. And when we do, it'll be a good day. And the sooner we get there, the fewer people will have to die or go bankrupt. But it won't make it harder when we finally decide to do the right thing that we delayed. But that's not what happens with climate change, because here the negotiation is not the normal political negotiation between different groups of human beings. That's how politics works and how it needs to work. Uh, you know, um, you're a libertarian and think there shouldn't be a minimum wage. I think that it takes $30 an hour to live, and so that's what the wage should be. And we fight it out in the legislature and hit on $15, and we come back in a couple of years and fight it out again and make progress. That kind of compromise is necessary, and it's what politicians do and so on. The negotiation that fundamentally underlies climate change is a negotiation between human beings and physics. And that's not a negotiation that we're going to win because physics does not care. It doesn't care where in the business cycle we are or how close to the next election or on and on and on. Physics just does. I mean, we could hope and wish that God had set it up some other way, but that's the way it got set up, you know. So our job is to figure out how to respect that line. And what the scientists tell us is we are up against that line now. So if we, <laughs> there may come a point at which these conversations are moot, um, where we've waited too long. And I, I accept the fact that there might be some point in my life when I just gonna go sit on the porch and drink whiskey and that'll be that. Um, but we're not there yet, and I hope that we never get there. People my age, probably anybody in this room, is not going to live long enough to see the final outcome of this story. 
Our job is to do everything that we can to preserve as many options as possible for those who come after us. Because what's happening now is we're getting further down this narrowing funnel where there are fewer and fewer options still available, where the outcome gets more and more determined. And our job is to open that up as much as we can. Thank you, Bill. Uh, question for you. You've given us an outlook on on the state of, of where we are and that we've got to get to work right away. Uh, when, when, it, when it is that we're talking about this to the general public and especially those climate deniers, how are we supposed to have these conversations, especially given the sense of urgency? Well, with true climate deniers, the conversation, I think, Reverend Malcolm, is hard. Um, um, because we're not talking about people who are sort of waiting for the next issue of nature or science to arrive on their doorsteps and see one more study and have the scales fall from their eyes. It's ideologically motivated and very hard to change. Uh, you know, I mean, look, we have a, we have a major TV network in this country whose entire business model consists of scaring old people about things. And so it's very hard to overcome some of that, you know. But the good news is that we've built a large movement, and that's been very helpful. And Mother Nature is a terrifically good educator. Um, at a certain point, you know, who are you going to believe? Fox News or your own lying eyes. And, and that's, I think, the biggest reason that we're about at this country 70% of people understanding that global warming is a serious problem that the government needs to take on. In our country, 70% is pretty good anymore on just about anything. Our problem, I think, is less convincing the other 30% who are going to be hard to convince. Um, it's activating that 70% enough of them to really be taking a serious role in making change. Because it's easier for all of us to just wait for someone else to be out in front and doing it. We need a lot of people out in front. But, but if you're trying to persuade, I mean, one way of saying this is, I will sometimes say in the autumn when I'm talking to young people, uh, don't ruin Thanksgiving, you know, trying to convince your crazy uncle, because it's probably not going to happen. Um, um, but do talk to your sweet aunt, you know, who's probably worried about what's going to happen to her grandchildren and, you know, get her a little engaged in this fight. And one of the ways to do that, of course, that's especially available to us is to take it from a faith and religious framework. Um, um, one of the best environmentalists in the world right now, happily, is the most important figure in Christendom, Pope Francis, whose encyclical Laudato Si' in 2015 is the most thoroughgoing critique of modernity that there is in a very powerful document. And it's powerful in part because he's quite willing to speak in theological language, in the language of faith. We actually don't need a resolution from the UCC explaining anything about the science of climate change. The scientists have already done that. We don't need it endorsed and ratified by the UCC. What we need the UCC doing is talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ and dealing with a warming world. And that's a slightly different task, but a very powerful one. And that's the language that we can bring when we're in our persona as people of faith. We all have different personas in our lives. But for those of us for whom this is an important one, it's important, I think, to speak that language sometimes and to speak it forthrightly, you know, uh, we may or may not be able to defend the world at this point. We're going to give it our best shot. But we should certainly be able to defend the gospel and the plain spoken and serious language that it provides for us about 
how we're supposed to behave in this world. Thank you, Bill. Even though a part of me wants to continue this portion of our program indefinitely, we must conclude. Well, yes, and I yep. just want to say uh, uh, it's important to get off because the story of this fight about the Formosa plastics plant is a great reminder of the sort of crucial role that environmental justice and the kind of frontline communities play in this work and our ability to sort of combine frontline uh, uh, commitment around particular places and projects with a generalized understanding of the fact that we have to take on the entire petrochemical industry in order to defend the overall climate of the planet. That's the synthesis that's actually, if we're going to win, going to allow us to win. So I'm so glad that they're coming to talk now and so grateful to you all for letting me be part of this today. Thank you.